All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from a actually a heat wave in San Diego today. Uh, and I'm delighted to be joined uh, by Rich Christensen, who's actually in, in Utah, which is probably just as hot, if not hotter. <laughs> well, we've cooled down a little bit, but it was scorching hot this summer. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. And and Rich is a globally recognized thought leader, educated me, educator, mentor, parallel entrepreneur, and humanitarian. Uh, he assists people in fearlessly facing their dragons, making peace with them, and navigating the intricate mazes of their lives. Um, Rich, you authored The Zigzag Principle, McGraw-Hill, a Wall Street Journal, and USA Today national bestseller. You founded the Entrepreneur Leadership Center and served as chairman of the Board of Trustees of Southern Utah University, and you've also served on the Utah State Board of Education, and you live with your wife uh, and five amazing sons, 10 grandchildren, wow. As yeah, well as a daughter now, so we got to update that. Yeah, you got a, a daughter from Nepal, that's awesome. But what we want to talk about, Rich, and this is what we alluded to before uh, we came on air. So you've been known very much, you know, in the entrepreneurial space and all that and uh, business, but you have a new book called Blindsighted. So just yeah. give me give me the genesis of, of this new book. Well, the book really does go to my personal story and background. If you uh, will a little bit, you got the Lord of the Rings, but before that, you don't understand it unless you read The Hobbit. <laughs> and so this is kind of honestly my Hobbit story, it, very complicated to come out with. Uh, I rewrote Zigzag Principle Revision 2 and did it in three days. This one was a, a five-year project, right. New York Times investigative reporter for a year, and the most complicated and delicate thing that I've ever written. But I felt it was vitally important to write at this stage in my life. I saw several of my mentors go through this same kind of metamorphosis I did, particularly like Stephen Covey, where mm -hmm. it hits a point of how do we really manifest in the, perv uh, the private uh, portions of our life and how we get to a, a point of flow. And so it was really necessary that I, I kind of disclose this. Uh, I had basically my life completely un come undone. Uh, at the age of 53 years old. And it really, really did prompt me to analyze very deeply all my premises and my identity and, and come to the conclusion of you know, what's really important and how do we form a real relationship with ourself, with our God, with our deity, whatever else. And the result of that then ends up, I think, being far more effective and profound in our personal life, in our family life, and also in how we manifest publicly. So part of this is then, um... Some of this goes back, as you said, I mean, this is a very personal, I mean, a lot of this, some of this goes back to your formative years, right? Uh, that That is correct, uh, John. Uh, I, I was raised in a very unique environment. I think oftentimes when you, you, and I've had a remarkable life, I think I'm the luckiest guy ever. You know, I, one of my favorite introductions is Rich is like 60 years old, but he's like 176 years old in wisdom. He's been <laughs> in more knife fights than anyone I know. And I think that's true. I've lived the most rich, deep, amazing life, but my formative years were incredibly, brilliantly, wonderfully complicated. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a home where my, my father had an eidetic memory. He's the single smartest person I've ever met in my life. And wow. as you know, we've talked about some pretty smart people that we both mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Uh, he lost his eyesight at the age of four years old to retinoblastoma. And my grandparents had to make the impossible decision. Do we allow this little blind boy to see until he's eight or remove his eyes and give him maybe a one in 20, 30 chance of living right in the middle of the Great Depression when the only prospects for a little blind boy was begging or mm. work for the circus? Right. And fortunately, that was not my father's outcome because of his brilliance. He not only passed the bar exam, but had the highest prosecution rate of any attorney in the state. Wow. So my father, this most brilliant, logical man in the world, marries my mother, a beauty queen, 15 years his junior, who turned down multiple marriage proposals. Two years later, along comes me. <laughs> and I had this brilliant opportunity to, to marry the beauty of the world and communication of my mother's art to my father and be the eyes of my father. So a very unique and interesting childhood uh, mm -hmm. I was exposed to. And and how did that impact you? I mean, when you did to be the eyes of your father and to be in that, I mean, how did that, how did that impact you? Because that's a, that's a lot of pressure for a kid in many ways. Oh, I, I never was a kid. 
Yeah, that's and, and that's the joy and also the challenge of it is I really never I always related to adults at seven years old. I could carry on full stream conversations with an adult, but never did relate to kids. My I was the weirdest <laughs> little kid you ever met in your entire life in a <laughs> joyful way now. Sure. So you know, I mean, literally, my dad couldn't see he loved cars. So he would get me in the the engine of a car and I'd be tuning carburetors at the age of five, six, seven years old with my wow. dad telling me what to do. So it was a remarkable experience, you know, sitting in the front seat, my mom helping navigate. So it was a beautiful, beautiful gift. And indeed, my dad was my ultimate hero. But I mm. never could quite please him, no matter what. And I didn't understand that. No matter how I tried, I couldn't get him to say, I'm proud of you, son, you know. And so I didn't really understand that until I was in my mid-50s and this big reveal occurred. But uh, I, I don't remorse my childhood at all. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, I think I'm so lucky and fortunate. I mean, enabled. I mean, I founded and co-founded 51 businesses now. Who's crazy enough to do that? Yeah. <laughs> Someone maybe with the background that I had. So it, yeah. it's all good, but it it has to be honestly complicated. Yeah. So how did that how did that experience of your of uh, your you know your formative years, how did that translate as you got older and started to get into, you know, into life and business on your own? Well, we talked a lot, of, you know, a little bit earlier before we got on that I was uh, one of the early stage uh, engineers and uh, involved in Novell. Mm -hmm. And it, it provided this beautiful context of engineering and structure and logic of my father, but yet the ability to have art and creation of my mother. What I didn't realize, and I know we'll get this later in the interview, is I had a third strand of DNA in there, which was the entrepreneurial creation part mm -hmm. of it. And so it really did serve me well and allow me to very verbally articulate and at the same time also be a creator yeah. so format formation of, i mean it's been my secret spidey gift all along it freaks me out even sometimes of being able to see one two three four five jumps ahead and then what's behind the corner yeah. and that's been my entire career is is i'm always seven years ahead of anything else that's happening you know and, and that that gift of childhood is is how that occurred and I think oftentimes, you know, if any of you have had traumatic childhoods, which most have, we most have these very challenging things that happen, mm -hmm. four, five, six, seven. I mean, don't don't lament them. Now you've got that problem. What are you going to do with it and use it as rocket fuel to drive your progression? And yes. when you sit there in misery about it, that's when we get into problems. Yeah, because I think sometimes people think, I mean, I think it's just good to acknowledge because I think sometimes people think that, you know, you hear of people have traumatic childhoods, right? And you think... Trauma has to be something like massive, big no. impact. It can be small little no. things that just need to be just need to be acknowledged later. Every one of us have it. And most of the issues we have in our life, the segative self-talk happens because of our five, six, seven year old stuff. And it can be really, uh, you know, big and other times not. I jokingly say most of who I really relate to me is entrepreneurs. And I'll make this statement. Entrepreneurs are the most unfunctional faking functional people in the world. <laughs> you show me the more significant kind of entrepreneur and I'll show you someone that is hiding some pretty significant trauma. <laughs> so and I'm the king of it, by the way. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so, so as part of your, as part of your book, Dan, how, how do you, how does this help, help, how does your book help people um, make better connections across their, their, their families and, and those they work with and just their community in general? Well, I think that it goes beyond just, you know, for family and fans. It has to start with yourself. Yeah. And I know you'll get to this later in the podcast, but I, I really, truly didn't love myself and couldn't really, even though I had all these amazing public successes, I really didn't love and relate to myself until I had to face these impossible discoveries and demons that I came to. And so, I, I, I John, I call it operating in a cycle of flow rather than force. And if you'll picture an infinity symbol that goes, horizontally, uh, it, that's a cycle of flow. And at what mm -hmm. point your personal values and how you behave in the quiet moments of your life, those values are in alignment with how you behave in your family segment of your life. And that's then where we all manifest publicly. Sales pop, oh, look at those bright colors with that fancy logo. We love to do that. But if that's not congruent with where we spend our personal time, which is mm -hmm. wealth. Wealth is not money. It is not mm -hmm. money. Wealth is we are well, emotionally, mentally, spiritually well. At what point you have your wealth aligned with your personal, aligned with your uh, family, aligned with your public casting, 
then at that point, you really have something powerful. And, and that's the point I've got to. Oh, my gosh, if I'd known it was this easy and this operating in flow was this easy, gosh, I would have quadrupled the number of businesses I had. So yeah. I really encourage everyone to look for flow in their lives. Yeah, and I think alignment is always a is always a challenging thing because we don't realize sometimes that parts are you know misaligned. So tell me then about so tell me about you know what what was the big what was the big incident or the, the what was your path to change? What was the catalyst for the change? Well, the catalyst for for the the change and I guess the big reveal that the mm -hmm. book is about. I spent a lot of time building to it. Mm -hmm. Be patient because the the wait is worth it. But at the age of 53 years old, I had a younger brother, youngest brother, that we'd always jokingly uh, re referred to him as the milkman son. And I feel really grateful now we did that. Oh, no. But he looked different. His temperament was different. And we just was always joking. And my mom would say, oh, that comes from the Madsen side. And so as a joke, he had a great big party on his birthday that he does every year. Best parties you've ever been to your life. And and got a DNA test and uh, opened it up and read, and it, he was 50% Jewish. So there's no, we're all Danish. And so what's going on? Mom died very young of breast cancer. So one by one, us brothers started taking the DNA tests and discovered that we were all half brothers. So now do you go to your 93-year-old uh, father and say, uh, Mom was doing something on the side? which we couldn't imagine because she was sure. like so uh, pure. And so finally we approached him, uh, dad, and he said, uh, he said, oh, you caught us. I'll tell this only once and only once. And then we'll never speak about it ever again. And uh, he went on to say that because of his retinal blastoma, he had sterilized himself. They broke up and then uh, magically they got back together again. Mom says she'd only seen dad cry one time in his entire life. And I'm sure this was the vent. And then two years later, come, along comes me. Well, it, it turns out that, uh, and keeping in mind, my dad was the county attorney. Mm -hmm. In our religion, it's completely illegal. So he would have been put in jail for what they did. It right. would also have been excommunication from the religion. But uh, I turned out to be one of the very, very early donor-conceived children in the world. <sighs> and as we went deeper and deeper into it, the discoveries even got more significant. So uh, th that was the premises of the uncoming, this, this man that I not only idolized, but modeled and everything I was trying to prove ended up not being my biological father and it ended up being the ultimate family secret. So how did that, I mean, initially, what was your, I mean, initial, obviously, complete shock, but as you tried to process it, I mean, what was that, what was that process like of trying to process this? Well, there's a reason it took five or six years to write the book. Yeah. In all honesty, you know, it went from thousands of pages, New York Times investigative reporter for a whole year, and, and the motions went very broad on it, John, all mm -hmm. the way from raging, red hot scorch to sad, mopey, victim, you know, uh, belittled. And, and I had to very, very gradually work at it and go through a, a number of healing modalities to get it back to the middle. And I think it's the main thing I'm proud of it in the book is as is, is many of these really, you know, sensational stories that we hear, individuals walk in, they, they vomit, and then they leave everyone else to clean up the mess. And I didn't do that. I, I got all the way where I cleaned my own mess up and, and uh, really got to a solid, stable clarity point. Mm -hmm. And how much of that then was, was then like flipping it on its head a little bit and sort of seeing that what your father did was, was, was kind of a, a, almost an extreme selfless act in many ways. The ultimate. ultimate. It's the greatest ultimate love story I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. And how glorious it is that I get to be part of that, that they would break every rule, every law, every convention at the time to manifest me and allow me life. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, deeper than that is, is my biological father ended up being the first abortion doctor in the state of Utah. And I look like him and act like him and behave like him. And in, in the culture in Utah, as you can well imagine, mm -hmm. that's not really down the middle of the road. And so what incredible sacrifice Doc made to provide me life. Mm. And so it's the ultimate love story, but it also has the shadow side. Sure. Because there uh, was incredible guilt, shame, and hiding it. When I was 12 years old, I went to my mom. I said, mom, something is not right here. Am I adopted or something? I am a weird kid. I do not fit in. Something's not right. 
And she says, no, 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 son, you're my son. But didn't give the whole truth. And so oftentimes the, the things that we hide and cover up end up carrying gravity and energy and, and they end up actually rotting us. And so mm. I think one of the purposes of this story is, is to actually show the importance of being impeccable with our word. Right. And having truth because it does carry gravity and weight. Despite, mm -hmm. I mean, the story is actually even more significant than had it been if I was just the son of a blind man, even. Right, right. And do you think, I mean, this happened when you were 53. Do you think you would have been ready for it earlier? It would have been very complicated. Maybe somewhat earlier, certainly not. I mean, I already spent half of my teenage years stuck in a garbage can or hanging from a coat closet. So I brought, it was very good decision they made, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to privately. I think in today's environment better, but I, I think the timing... There is no perfect timing. Uh, probably, uh, my brothers and I all agree, it probably would have been appropriate for us to hear it from mom before she passed. Right, right. So how has, uh, so w once you got over the initial shock and you, you started to realize, how how has this, if you like, how has this con um, set you up for the rest of your life? Like, would to get to where you are today how have you how have you negotiated this this journey from the shock revelation to being aligned and centered well i think it's actually expanded my purview first of all uh gave a much broader scope and i think helped me to focus in on what's even really important although i had really done that you know with my legato family framework such but uh, there's been a lot of emphasis now on the content i'm providing is getting in touch with your your real true self I love the Oliver Wendell Holmes quote, for this side of simplicity, I would not give a fig, but simplicity on the other side of complexity for that, I would give my life. Mm -hmm. And so I think I, I'm spending, I think my thought leadership is far more precise, far more in tune, much less ego manifestation. And quite frankly, I just don't really give a rat's <laughs> what people think, because I just, what really matters is, is the incongruency with what I really am and with what my soul wants to manifest. Yeah. And with that comes a lot of internal peace and confidence. I spend a lot of energy. And I'm for those of you that are zigzag readers, it was an incredible book. It affected tens of thousands of young entrepreneurs. But I apologize because I manifest a lot of ego in there show, trying to show I was the man. I just don't need to do that anymore. It's like mm -hmm. I'm okay just standing in my power and being what I am and, and inclusive with others in their challenges. Just not to be a foo-foo hippie, but I've turned into it just a mm -hmm. little bit that that uh, it, it's okay to uh, embrace ourselves as a you know, broken part of, a, of who we really are. Yeah. And, and so, so how, so for people really understanding like their true self and their true core values, I mean, I, I think that's something that a lot of us all still struggle with, like, oh. you know, with, with identifying those. Absolutely. Deeply, deeply. And I, although not a shame was plugged, go to my website, richchristiansen.com. I got a number of tools on there. Uh, as you're aware, Stephen Covey was one of my pr primary influences and mentors in life. Mm -hmm. And he spent a lot of time on principles. I've spent much of my career on values, which is one step up of self-identifying. We're very good at knowing our values in our businesses, in our public manifestation, or our university, or sports teams. We're not very good at it in our family. And that's why families are just fracturing, breaking apart, and we're even worse at it in identifying what our individual ethos is. But I would put forward the premise, if we do not understand who we truly are and have our own ethos, nor does anyone else. And we telegraph that. We send beacons out all the time. People know that we're incongruent. And that's why getting in and flow and actually being okay with who you really are, like it's the ultimate ticket. You know, if you really want to sell pop, mm -hmm. if you really want to sell pop, then manifest who you truly are. Because when it's sticky, when you're manipulative, when you're wiggling in the edges and saying, oh, for 1995 and a Gen Z night, we're all the <laughs> we just vomit when you're genuine and authentic and speaking impeccably with your word and manifesting who you really are. Even if I disagree with you, I know it and I'm good and I'll buy from you. The people yeah. I won't buy from are the people who are sticky. And we all know it. We all have this spidey sense to know when people are sticky. So I yeah. think it's critically important that we get in alignment with our values. Yeah. And, and in some ways, uh, Rich, I mean, I think it's, it's becoming even more difficult for people because they're letting so many external influences into their lives, yeah. you know, through technology, social media, all of this stuff. 
um, that I think many people are, are continuing to move away from who they really are as opposed yep. to moving towards it. Well, and all the t everything in society is telling us the anxiety, the depression. If you mm -hmm. want to really cut that off, turn the cell phone off and go for a walk. Try yep. bath work with me. Oh, my gosh. I do breath work every day now. It's amazing the clarity that comes. I mean, just having a power hour, you'll double, quadruple your efficiency if you just know what's really important and you listen a little bit to your, to your soul and your internal knowing. And, and many of the problems we've got, I mean, I'm a big proponent of, of technology all the way from artificial intelligence. to I mean, sure. amazing bright future. But if we lose the process of getting in touch of what we really are, it's all for naught. We just all go, you know, run out and wobble around in the woods with mosquitoes. The, well, if we lose, absolutely, if we lose touch with the essence of our hum, human humanity and our humanness, if you like, and what makes us all individuals, I think absolutely. I mean, we love technology. I think AI is great and all of that. But I think if you use it all properly, um, then it, it should give you more opportunity to do that's what right. you just said, to be with yourself. And I think that's the that's the thing that I, I see people struggle with, Rich, uh, so much today is that idea of spending time with yourself. I talk about this ad nauseum, so I apologize to the audience. But people seem to struggle with spending any time with themselves. Like they always, they allow their phone to distract them. They're, it's 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 almost terrifying for some people to actually, as you said, to go out for a walk with no phone and just look at the trees and birds. You know, I, I think that one of my favorite statements actually comes from Parker Palmer, but facing our fears, fears with reality and the concept of allowing our soul to quietly peek out and taking a look at our, our soul. Mm -hmm. I like that. And, and that requires timidly. We can't do it big and brazenly and bullishly. So, you know, many of the tools that I pr provide uh, actually are little abstraction tools to put cartilage in between bone on bone. Many of the relationships that we have in life now are bone on bone. Our political system, bone on bone. Our religions, bone on bone. And we've got to get cartilage in there and fun, playful little ways that we can abstract and begin again the beautiful, artful dance of life. Mm -hmm. And much of that comes by slowing it down, not by mm -hmm. speeding it up, slowing it down. And, and again, I back to the point is the big thing that I've learned now is, oh, my gosh, I'm a thousand times more productive. I know exactly what to say no to. I don't engage things that don't align, misalign anymore. Before I was out there, the man trying to crank everything up, not anymore. And it's amazing how the noise of my life have just simplified in the level of internal peace and harmony. I mean, a good thing I don't crack a joke because I'd laugh at it, even if it's bad. And it feels really good to be able to laugh at my own bad jokes. And I think that that's what we all, I never thought I'd ever get there to this point in my life. And I'm so grateful that I did. Uh, and, and this big uncovery is, is what did it. So how perfect is a big mess? Yeah, I mean, there you go from, uh, as, as one person who I had on the show, she she does a thing called mess to success. And this is, uh, I mean, exactly, but this is personal success. And, and, um, and what I what I love about your, your story, Rich, is, is the fact that it's never too late, is it? I mean, you know, wow. you're, you're, it's never too late to have to have a, a, a an awakening like you, you talk about. Um, but I do think I do think the core message that you, you're really uh, you're, you're really communicating here is is to really find out who you are and be that person. Yeah, John, I have a really fun little thing, and I don't want to put a shameless plug, but on my website, oh, yeah, develop, the way, this, the way. develop this really really fun little free tool. It's called the Soul Expression Map Exercise, and all it is is this very fun little theme of abstraction that allows us to kind of peek out and show who we are. Uh, asking questions like, what's your spirit animal? If you could be an animal, what is your shadow animal? What is your shape? What is your color? And uh, doing that with a significant other, the people we love is amazing what happens when we start peeking out mm -hmm. and showing who we really are. Yeah. So if you're really interested in this, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Starting to manifest who you really are, go, go to my website and look at Soul Expression Map Exercise and, and it'll just shock you how many bears you can break down with a few well-selected questions. Yeah, yeah, I do. My spirit animal is a coyote. And uh, yeah. there you go. And uh, I, I never talk about stuff like this. So people are going to start thinking I've turned into a hippie as well. But... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know people don't even believe it now, but it's the only jam because it actually is the very core of efficiency. Mm -hmm. And going out and just beating our head down with walls, we don't need to do it anymore. You know, yeah. we just don't need to do it anymore. A, a coyote. Now that says a lot about you right there. Does. 
And people, and it's funny, it's one of the most misunderstood spirit animals too, which is interesting. Um, if you really investigate into it, it's, it's very, it's quite, it, they're very complicated. And, and very resilient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And very resilient. Well, we have plenty of them around here in, uh, and they are very resilient. Beautiful. I mean, I think they're beautiful animals, but anyway. I do too. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and as I was uh, end up, I think one of the key takeaways is I always like to quote my uh, my compatriot Oscar Wilde, who said, "You know, be yourself because everyone else is taken." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's a really good quote. Yeah, yeah that's really good. Well, I listen, Rich, this has been fascinating. I mean, we could go on for hours, and maybe you'll come back, and we could maybe do a part two because I think it's such such uh, such wisdom you have to share. Um, all of Rich's information will be below this video, including the links that uh, to his website and all of that. But before we go, just tell people a little bit more about you. Well, uh, I'm a. I think you said it at the start. Uh, most of all, I'm a, a. I love being a father. I love playing the divine masculine role, protection, and and just builder. I'm a, a, a dramatic builder and creator, and and most of all, now I'm just very hopeful for the future. I'm an eternal optimist, and I'm just so excited with what is to come. And I, I don't think we need to fear the future. I think that we get to have impact and control on the future. So. Really looking forward to this next phase of life. I, I never uh, thought that life would be this amazing. And so really would be delighted to come back and, yeah. and share more with you. Lots lots of more business and sell stuff to come. Yeah, no, absolutely. But you know something, Rich? I think everybody needs, uh, the way the world is today, uh, everybody needs a positive message. And I think you're delivering a, a, a positive message. You're one of the few people who are saying, like, life is great. Life is going to get better. The future's great. Oh. I mean, whereas, every, whereas most oh. people are fear, and fearful. It's so true. I don't want to take a bunch more time. But I mean, really, do you want to go back and sit on great grandpa's toilet? <laughs> I mean, we, it's the worst time in humanity. Do we want to go fight World War II? I Again, I mean, look I at the 40 million people that died in that or relive the bubonic plague. I mean, I know we got our challenges, but, you know, even like some of the scary things that we say really aren't that scary if we just take control. I, I think the biggest thing that concerns me is this division. A lot of the reason I put forward a lot of the content I have, like Legato Family and even ZigZag, is, is this divisiveness of losing community. And that's the big yeah. thing we got to change. We got to start doing small kindnesses for one another. We got to start paying attention and, and just giving back a little bit. And many of these little problems will instantly d dissipate. I, you know, again, um, something I always say ad nauseum as well, I agree with you, I think is, you know, you can, you can sit around on a Friday night and pontificate about the, all the problems in the world and what should be done or whatever, and you're making zero impact on them, right? But it, but it might feel nice to to rant and rave about it. But if you focus on being the best person, the best partner, spouse, whatever, the best father, the best you know neighbor, uh, whatever in your community, that's that's where you're making a real impact in the world. And if everybody was doing that, then the then all the you know the the ripples just continue to flow outwards. If we took and just each baked three cookies and took it out to the people that were uh, being angry instantly the anger would go down most of this visceral negative that we have going on is because they don't we don't want to be alone so it's better to hate someone and be angry than it is be alone and we just got to start doing kindnesses i think that that's I've, the very precipice of it you know something i just had an idea i think every 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 political person who comes calling to the door between now and the election, I think I'll, I'll get a cookie and give it to them. I won't, I won't say I, I'm not going to vote for you. I'm going to just say, here, have a cookie. <laughs> well, and, and I don't want to get political, but one of my dear friends is the governor of the state now. Mm -hmm. And he just ran a campaign. He just got done being the uh, chair of all the governors. And his whole thing was disagree better, how we can mm -hmm. civilly disagree. And I was so moved by a story of a group of protesters came to his private home. And we're out with signs and banner. This wasn't the mansion. This was his private mm -hmm. home where his family was. Bashing and yelling and screaming mean, mean things. And you know what he and Abby did? They baked cookies and hot chocolate because it was cold and took it out to the protesters. <laughs> and the protesters. Don't think that didn't diffuse. Oh, yeah. Well, it's kind of how do you how do you how do you hate on and be aggressive with people who are approaching you with cookies and hot chocolate on a cold night? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, Rich. All right. Well, we'll listen, we'll wrap it up there. Thanks again, Rich. Thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you all again very soon. Yeah.